Hello everyone. The topic of today's lecture is Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection, which explains how evolutionary change occurs. Within the topic of biological evolution, we understand that species change over time. We're also relating Charles Darwin's inference that all living things share a common ancestry. The image on the right-hand side of the slide is showing this point. We see many examples here of life forms around the outside edge of the circle. Here is a starfish, an example of an echinoderm. Here are rod-shaped bacterial cells. We can see the three domains. The eukaryota are these organisms shown on this side, the bacteria right here, and the archaebacteria down below. Why do all of these life forms have branches which go directly to the center of the circle? The center of the circle would represent the universal common ancestor, the living thing from which all life forms have descended. Let's discuss a little bit more about Charles Darwin. Darwin was born in 1809, died in 1882. The major event in Charles's life was the voyage of the Beagle. This was a voyage that he made on a ship called the Beagle. Uh, it lasted from 1831 through 1836. During that time, the Beagle sailed around the earth. And Darwin was on board as the naturalist. During his time on the Beagle, he made many observations about the natural world, geology, and of course, made observations about many, many, many different types of living things. After returning to England, Darwin is trying to come up with explanations for why there are so many different types of living things. He starts to formulate ideas, but he waits a number of years to publish his ideas. He actually doesn't publish until 1859. The work that he does publish is titled On the Origin of Species. In this book, he explains how he would explain how evolutionary change has occurred. It is a common misconception that Darwin invented Evolution, in fact, he did not. Uh, evolution is actually something which was being discussed by scientists before Darwin was a scientist. In fact, one of the major early theories about evolution was published in the year 1809 by a scientist named Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Now, one of the major reasons why Darwin finally decides to publish in 1859 is that another scientist by the name of Alfred Russell Wallace had formulated almost identical ideas about how evolution occurs. Darwin came to know about Russell's ideas and was encouraged by family members, most notably his brother, to publish, to establish his priority, the fact that he actually came up with these ideas first. Uh, the image on this slide, we see actually one of Darwin's original drawings where he says, I think the tree of life is illustrated here and we see a, a beginning point and we see branches coming off of that point where we're getting the development of new species. Darwin did have many influences. People who, whose writings caused him to formulate his ideas about natural selection. One important one was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck who proposed a theory of evolution back in 1809. Lamarck's theory is commonly called acquired characteristics. It has really been discredited. Uh, however, interestingly, within the world of microbes now, there are times where we might actually argue that Lamarckian evolution kind of works. Uh, another important influence on Darwin was Charles Lyell, who wrote a book titled Principles of Geology, 1830 to 1833. The basic main idea which was really important to Darwin was that the earth was very, very old, much older than the five to six thousand years that most people believed at this time. This allowed for the kind of time frame needed for evolutionary change to occur as Darwin believed that it did. We also have Thomas Malthus who was an economist who wrote about the importance of competition. Malthus was thinking about the competition between businesses, but Darwin took these ideas and applied them to the natural world and said, well, why wouldn't we think that it's important for animals to be competing with each other for food or space or water? We also have uh, Darwin's interest in selective breeding, artificial selection, where humans are breeding animals and plants and choosing wanted traits. Uh, and by this process, they can produce new breeds or varieties. And Darwin said, if it is possible to breed animals and plants to bring about changes in them, couldn't nature do the same thing? 
we see here on this slide an example of artificial selection. The two plants shown here are related to each other. We have Teosinte, which is uh, a plant which is found in the wild in much of Central America. And then we have modern corn. Now, Teosinte was cultivated by the indigenous people of Central America and over the course of many, 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 many years through selective breeding they were able to pull out traits that were desirable and they actually created a new plant. They created corn or maize and we can see that there are um, many, many similarities as we're comparing genetic sequences of these two plants and interestingly now there's a big movement to try to go into the genome of Teosinte to find genes which would give really desirable traits to modern corn plants. Drought resistance, resistant to insect pests, uh, so there's a lot of research going on in this area. Now, the theory of natural selection. This is Darwin's theory that explains how evolution occurs. Remember back to those the first lecture when we were talking about the goals of science. One of the big goals of science is to have explanatory power. And what Darwin's theory gives us is a very powerful theory which explains how life on Earth has changed over time. The components of Darwin's theory include four things. There's genetic variation or variation within a species. There's overproduction of offspring. There is struggle for existence. There is differential survival and reproduction. We'll have a m multiple opportunities in class to investigate these components of natural selection in greater detail. Let's look at an example of how we would explain a phenomenon by using the theory of natural selection. We know that weed plants can develop resistance to herbicides, the sprays that we use to try to kill those weeds. So let's look at each component of natural selection and, and relate how these factors would be involved in plants developing resistance to the herbicides. Genetic variation. Individual weed plants within one species, so I'm talking about all dandelions, okay, not any other weeds right now, just dandelions. The individual weed plants are unique. They're not all genetically the same as each other. Now to humans, all dandelions may look the same, but there are actually individual differences. Just as when we look from one human to the next, we see those differences. We're aware of those differences. But you know, to the dandelions, we probably all look the same too. Overproduction of offspring, this means that many weeds are going to sprout and grow each year. If you don't treat your lawn, you're going to know that this is true. Struggle for existence, a farmer or a homeowner is applying herbicides, spraying their field or their lawn to try to get rid of this, this weed. And then differential survival and reproduction, we're going to have some of the weeds being killed by the application of the herbicide. However, some of the plants are going to survive. It'll be those plants who reproduce. And over the course of many years, uh, repeated cycles of spraying and plants being killed, but some surviving and those plants reproducing, we're going to have the development of weeds, plants, which are much more resistant all the time to the herbicide. Uh, we want to note here that herbicide resistance is an example of an adaptation. This obviously leads to the question, what are adaptations? These are traits that have evolved over time due to natural selection. Adaptations are going to increase the long-term reproductive success of an organism. We classify adaptations into one of three categories. The first of which is a morphological or an anatomical adaptation, a body structure adaptation. For example, protective shells or spines. On plants, we could think about plants that produce thorns, and this is going to prevent animals from eating that plant, or it may serve other purposes too. Behavioral adaptations. Many organisms are capable of behavioral adaptations. In the video, The Eternal Arms Race, we saw an example of an organism called the hognose snake. We learned that it plays dead, and this serves to aid in the survival of individual hognose snakes because many predators will not eat another organism which is already dead. So this behavior is adaptive because it's going to benefit the survival of that particular species. Let's continue our consideration of behavioral adaptations. We would describe this as an innate behavior that it is programmed into the genes of the hognose snake. It was not a learned behavior. 
uh, again from the video we saw that the baby hognose snakes were showing this behavior before they would have had any time to learn it. They didn't go to baby hognose snake school. They had this behavior programmed into their genes. When they feel threatened, they flip over and they play dead. Physiological adaptations are chemical uh, adaptations or, or molecules are involved here. We saw an example again in the video, the eternal arms race with the orange-bellied newt or the Tarachan newt. Uh, this is a amphibian which produces toxins that are so poisonous to predators that um, it, it's going to kill a predator. In fact, the toxins from a single Taracha newt would be enough to kill many people. Uh, another example of physiological adaptation would be, again, the hognose snake. Uh, we saw that as the hognose snake was playing dead, it was also emitting a really foul odor that would add to this uh, this trickery, okay, that the hognose snake is dead. By giving off that really bad smell, it's mimicking uh, the smell of, of decomposing flesh. Finally, let's review the main ideas of evolution. Uh, it's important to understand that populations evolve. We're, we don't ever talk about the evolution of individuals. You don't evolve during your lifetime. The genetic makeup that you are born with is the genetic makeup that you're going to die with. Um, Evolution really is the change in the frequencies of different alleles, different forms of genes over many, many, many generations. Evolution is not going to be a directed event uh, which is moving towards the perfection of a species. Uh, evolution is going to provide adaptations that work within the environment where organisms live. Divergent evolution, adaptive radiation. Uh, this is rapid evolution to fill ecological niches. We'll discuss in class uh, some examples of adaptive radiation. One example would be the rapid evolutionary change which occurred in the mammals after the KT event which really triggered the the end for the dinosaurs. These processes are going to be driven by mutation and natural selection. Adaptive radiation is meaning that we go from having uh, maybe one species or a small number of species to all of a sudden we're getting lots and lots and lots of different types of species within a group of organisms. Convergent evolution is going to produce analogous structures. Uh, for example, if we were to look at the body structures of dolphins and sharks, we would see many commonalities. However, the dolphin is a mammal, the shark is a fish. The reason why they have such similar body plans is because they live in the same environment. The environment has shaped their evolution. The process of natural selection has given them fins or flippers, tails which, which are very similarly structured. Uh, but again, they're, um, these structures evolved separately. So we're talking about convergent evolution here. Finally, coevolution is when two species are going to influence each other's evolution. I think the example of uh, again, from the eternal arms race, when we were looking at the example of the cheetahs and the gazelles shaping each other's evolution, is really, really, really important to help us understand coevolution. Cheetahs have evolved over history, or you know, beyond history, to be very, very, very fast because their prey, the gazelle, are also very, very fast. And um, we again saw many examples of that uh, topic in the video, the eternal arms race. Thank you, everybody and I will speak with you next time.